Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all of your blessings and your love for us and the courage that you give us, the courage that we're probably going to need very soon. And I pray for our nation that you would bring order uh, of a proper kind, that you would still uh, maintain our freedom, that you won't allow anyone to take it away. Should we come under persecution, Father, uh, even unto death, give us great courage that we might stand for you and be a blessing to others and an encouragement to them. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. And we've been here for a long time. He talks about being strengthened with all power, you know, according to his glorious might, which we studied was uh, actually being made powerful by his unlimited power. This is God's omniscience, I mean, excuse me, omnipotence uh, through the ministry of the Spirit who indwells us, giving us power. We discussed how that power was about knowledge and understanding and being able to apply this to life to win in the spiritual war. So we were going to attain, attain all steadfastness or endurance. And we spent several weeks talking about uh, how God's power enables us to endure how he develops it through little tests, little adversities that he brings along, and we trust his promises to, to, to see through those adversities, and we see God come through for us. We see God come through again, and then again, and then the adversities get bigger, and they get deeper and more meaningful, and they, they get closer to your true value system. And as you continue to grow, this is how he gets you to grow, is he, he brings it on, Brings, allows the negatives in your life, the things that uh, hinder your human agenda. And in order for you to be able to continue to be at peace, to be confident, you have to trust God. And as you do that, your strength grows. You, you learn once again that God is faithful, that he doesn't honor your faith. Listen, this is not about your faith. This is about God's word. He honors his word. And when you put your faith in his word, Listen, you're on the train with him. So you can get on God's train by faith. God's got a train. It's going to heaven. It's going to maturity. It's going to victory in this life. And that's the goal of leaving, leaving us here was to let us go through all these things, everything the devil could throw at you, and come out on top in this life to be a witness for God that the devil could have had what you have if had he only trusted and obeyed. But he didn't. He rebelled. And he, re he refused whatever was offered him or whatever system was set up in eternity past to deal with their sin. They refused it. And so here they are. Uh, God says, well, let's have this uh, little contest. We'll have a little uh, uh, show and tell. So he creates humans. And, and, you know, this is where you see the devil intervening in human life right at the very beginning. And you have to ask yourself, why would he do that? Of what interest are new creatures or, or humans to angels? They're a lot smarter and more powerful than us. But the goal was to get us to sin. Lots of reasons for that. One, maybe maybe God will uh, maybe God will step out of His righteousness to save us. You know, even though we're uh, unrighteous, maybe God will violate His own righteousness to save Adam and Eve. Of course, He'll never do that. You know, he resolved the justice and righteousness issue with the cross. He satisfied, it's called propitiation, by the way. That means satisfaction. What Christ did on the cross satisfied the justice of God on our behalf. You know, and then he died and rose from the dead and defeated death itself, the last great enemy. But endurance is what you have to develop to be able to grow into this mature stature. You have to be able to stick in there and trust and trust and trust. Now, often these two words are confused. Uh, hupomone is endurance to remain under the weight, and it just about always deals with circumstances. You know, the car broke down, or, you know, the economic system is failing, something like that. Now, patience, on the other hand, makrothumia means to be, be faithful with difficult people and relationships. Endurance is a, is a is a adversity word, circumstantial word. Macrothemia, patience, is a people word. 
So let's dig into this thing and see what we can get out of Colossians 1.11. We're in this state, we're in this flow from nine through about 14, where Paul is talking about our spiritual growth. You know, back in nine, he wanted us to be filled with the knowledge of God's desire for us through all wisdom and spiritual understanding, spiritual insight. And, and when that process is going in your life, it starts building this whole system that carries you down the line as you choose to, to learn, believe, and trust God over and over again, laying aside the false things in your life, the sinful things, just continue to lay those aside, try to remove them from your soul, then you continue to grow. Your stature in Christ grows, your maturity grows, your endurance grows, your inner strength grows, you know, your ability to love grows. And patience is connected intimately with your ability to, to love. So this word, uh, macrothumia, uh, Compared to endurance, hoop on Monday. Let me read you. Uh, I think this is, uh, I don't remember, this might be Thayer. The difference of meaning is best seen in their opposites. While hoop on Monday, endurance, is the temper which does not easily succumb to suffering, i.e., circumstances, macrothumia is the self restraint which does not hastily retaliate against a, per, uh, a wrong suffered. See, it means to it means restraint in the face of provocation. Somebody's provoking you. Somebody's really showing out. Somebody wants to, you know, these protesters that are in your face screaming, uh, these girls that are just screaming and shouting like children, throwing a fit. Uh, the way those people, the police and all, just stand and look at them, and hold their peace, I, I tell you, that's got to be a class and uh, training in itself. But that's the, that's the visible evidence of macrothumia. Uh, the one, the first one is opposed to cowardice or despondency. In other words, when everything goes wrong, you can either go into fear or depression. And he says the other is avoids wrath or revenge. You know, with relationships, when you suffer wrongs, the desire is often to wrong them back. And the Bible says, don't overcome, don't fight evil with evil. Fighting fire with fire is not the Christian way. He says, overcome evil with divine good, with God in your life, with God giving you love. My sweet wife, boy, what a great helper she is to me just keeps reminding me that these people that I consider enemies of our country, she said, continue to pray for them. Pray for George Soros. And this morning we talked about the Apostle Paul. And people say, well, that guy, that crazy guy, he'll never turn to Christ. Well, listen, the Apostle the Saul, the Pharisee did, and he was murdering Christians. He hated Christians, persecuting them. When he got them all in Jerusalem, that wasn't enough for him. He was going to he was going to go to all over Israel. So this guy had a lot of hate in his heart, and he turned it around. He came to Christ. So any of these people can do that, any of them. Continue to pray for them. Stop hating them. Stop wanting to destroy them like Elijah. I mean, yeah, Elijah destroyed the prophets of Baal. Elijah shouldn't have done that. See, God was trying to bring about uh, a reformation, a revival. And Elijah just shut it down by killing all those people. So we don't want to shut down God's revival. This is a world revival. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. I read about things and hear about things, you know, things people would call conspiracies. Don't know what's true or not true. I'm not in a position to know. I don't have contacts or relationships with people in, the, in that realm of life. So, you know, you just read stuff and you just ask yourself, what makes sense? You know, what makes sense? This, this world economic people that are trying to reset the world economy, create a whole new way. And, you know, we're going to, I'm going to personally resist all that. But, all right. Proverbs 16.32 says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his own emotions better than he who captures a city. 
So pretty cool stuff here. So let's learn patience. Let's learn where, where it comes from. It's not an isolated virtue. It's connected to agape love. Now, this word patience or makrothemia means patience, <laughs> forbearance, long-suffering. It's often translated long-suffering. It means slow to avenge something that has hurt you. You can find it in these passages in your notes, Romans 2.4, Romans 9.22, and onward. You can read those passages. In fact, we'll be drawing principles from those passages. Now, let's do uh, uh, what I call the doctrine of patience. Okay. First of all, patience is a manifestation of the essence of God. Listen to Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Do you think lightly of the riches of God's kindness and his forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? See, patience, this makrothumia, comes right out of the essence of God. It's part of the, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's part of God. God is patient. He is very patient with us. He's very patient with everyone. You know, this Romans 9.22 talks about how for all through, from, from the fall to the cross, God was patient with the human race, allowing things to develop, allowing people the, the space and the time to come to Christ. We have to learn to do that. Instead of judging people and shutting down on people and wanting to to eliminate people, we have to learn how to be patient and give people time and space. Hardest ones to do are your kids. You know, your kids, you worry about them. You wonder, you know, are they ever going to come to the Lord? Are they ever going to be open and positive to his word? You know, are they ever going to let, let their guard down and listen? Well, that's between them and the Lord. And your job is to be patient with them, to show kindness to them. To, to back off and let them work it out. Wait on them to show a need, a desire to know. Not just pushing all the time and pushing all the time. Everybody has to have the room, the space in which to develop their own soul. That requires patience from everyone else. Patience. So, 1 Timothy 1.16 says, And yet for this reason I found mercy. This is Paul talking. So that in me he found mercy from God. He persecuted the church. He says he murdered people. He separated families. He took kids away and, and gave them to the state. Put people in prison. Took all their possessions. Tough stuff. You know, things that are coming to America probably before long. So... Hopefully some of us will die out before we go through it. But I want to go through things like that. I don't want it to happen to my country. But, you know, those are the highest challenges that a Christian can face. These are the highest rewards that a Christian will ever receive. These murder rewards is facing the ultimate evil in your life. So before you die, wouldn't it be incredibly powerful and incredibly uh, a great blessing to be able to be face-to-face -face with great evil, ultimate evil, trying to destroy you, but it can't because of who you are in Christ and the maturity that you've developed, the strength that you have to keep trusting God, no matter how they twist or deceive or lie or try to confuse you. No, I'm sticking with the Lord. I know the Word of God. I want to quote the Word of God to myself. I'm going to use the eyes of my heart to see Christ, see him sitting at the right hand of the Father. I'm going to see myself sitting inside of him. I'm in Christ, sitting next to God the Father on the, in the throne room of heaven. So what can you do to me? Nothing you can do to me. Not a thing. You can hurt my body. You can bring pain to it, but you can't hurt my soul. No, not, not possible. So... For this reason, I found mercy. See, I've already been given mercy. So no matter who piles on me with pain or whatever, I've been given mercy. He says, so that in me, the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. In other words, Paul said, 
my life's an example so that those that come behind me can see how God dealt with me, how he was so merciful and so patient with me in spite of all that I had done against him, against him personally. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, I mean, who are you an example to? Let me tell you who you're an example to. Everyone around you. Everyone around you, you're an example. Learn to let go of the lies and your worldly connections, your desires you've attached to the things of the world. Learn to, learn to remove those hooks out of you and let it go. Let those things go on and let somebody else chase the gold and the silver and the, you know, the lust and the excitement and all those things. Take your passion, your desire, your heart, and you attach it to God. See in your mind you taking your heart and attaching it to Jesus Christ. You give it to him. See him taking it and putting it into his own heart. See, this is how you, this is how you. Uh, apply the word of God, you see it in your mind. That's what Paul said anyway, Ephesians 1.18. So, secondly, enabling believers to think patience is part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that in salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the body, making the believer's body the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. We are the temple. We have replaced our bodies have replaced the temple uh, of Israel. You know, Solomon's temple and then Herod's temple, and they're going to build another one, but it's not going to be related to Christ. You know, it's going to be built by unbelieving Jews, then it's going to be took over by the, uh, you know, the Antichrist. So that temple, listen, we're the temple. Your body and all of our bodies collectively Peter says we're like stones, individual stones in a building. And the building is being built. It's a, it's a temple for God. And so inside of you is the temple of God. Inside of me, all of us together are the temple of God. This is why we need to stick together and be patient with one another and let each other grow and help each other grow. That's what this is about. Look, I know that you do that with your, with your loved ones. Many of you are very mature, and I know that. I mean, I've known some of you for a long time, and I know that you're really rocking out in your spiritual life, and you're learning some new things. If you're with us, especially on Wednesday night, you're learning how to use the eyes of your heart to visualize the truth of your life, who you are now. You're no longer that person you used to be. You are in Christ. You share all who he is and all that he has. You share the power that he's given us in order to be able to overcome the old way of thinking and, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind to put on the new way of life and become like Christ. I promise you, if you keep going, just keep going every single day, trying to learn more, trying to see more, asking God for wisdom, listening to him, talking to him, filling out your spiritual life, focusing on the spiritual life, and unhook these things that have got you so so enslaved to something in the world. If it's your grandchildren, you know, has your life become a route about your grandchildren? You know, or your children, you know, or your business, you know, the only thing that's okay is golf. If you're enslaved to golf, then I think you're okay with the Lord. I'm just kidding. But, you know, I can't play anymore, so I, I miss that. But, my point is, we get we enslave ourselves by putting our faith and our connecting our desire to the things in the world, and then we believe those things can give us happiness. Then we look for that, we expect that to happen in our life, and that becomes our outward look at everything. We're all about getting those things. When we don't get them, then we're heartbroken. We're 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 busted inside, you know. And we live out our life either angry at God are depressed and discouraged because we didn't get what we wanted. Of course, the answer is to give up what you wanted because God's got something better. That's living the truth. So that's what you visualize in your mind. You visualize letting that thing go that has haunted you and hurt you and gave you this feeling of betrayal and my life didn't work out. You know, I wasn't good enough to make it happen. All of those 
silly thoughts that we all think when we fail. Well, you know, human life's full of failure. All along the way we fail, but we keep getting back up and we keep going. And if you do that with the Lord, you always win because he's already won. He's already won. So all he wants you to do is to keep running. Every time you fall down or get off course, you find yourself out in the middle in the grass somewhere just running in circles. You know, you wake up and you get back on the track. You keep on rolling. And before you know it, you're going to win this thing. Now, God's hope, God the Holy Spirit's job is to help develop this, this particular area of patience in the believer's life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We know this passage. The fruit or the production. Now, what that means, you know, I've heard people get all technical with this. What it means is that that your spiritual growth, you know, it's the parable of the sower. The sower sowed the seed. It got into the ground, into the good ground. You know, it grew up. It got enough moisture. It developed, and it produced a crop. Well, your relationship with the Holy Spirit in the Word, as you grow in the Word and your understanding of the Word and how it works in your life and it connects you with God, and you're able to start letting go of these wrong things, all of a sudden, you begin to produce fruit. These fruits are described, this fruit is described as love, agape love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Fruit is the result of spiritual processing and growth. It's going to produce fruit if you grow. And look, uh, the Spirit enables you to, to produce these things, but they're not magic. It's not a magical production. Here's my take on the fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit enables you to think and understand the relationships in your life so that you realize that you love someone. You love the Lord, and because you love the Lord, you want to please Him. And you're with someone who is provoking you, or you're with someone who's just very slow, or, you know, are not really interested, or whatever is, is irritating you. And rather than striking out and hurting the relationship and hindering your capacity for future ministry with this person, you hold your words. You hold your attitude. You let it go. You, you, you stay patient. The fruit of the Spirit in patience is from thinking. It's not some magical emanation out of your chest. It's thinking. It's understanding the importance of being kind in spite of the irritation that this person may be providing you. Because this word is about being patient under provocation. So you're being provoked by this person, and you know what God wants is not for you to slap them or hurt them or shoot them down with a machine gun. What God wants is for you to minister to them, to show love to them, to give them the gospel, to encourage them in the word, in spite of who and what they're being like right now. That's what patience does. The pace. So in order for you to get there, to, to use patience, you have to understand what's going on in this relationship. What's God doing in this relationship? Because if God's got you in that relationship, then there's a ministry purpose. And hopefully, all of your relationships are, are based on the will of God. If you're in relationships that aren't the will of God, yeah, I mean, you need to stop and ask yourself what it is you're pursuing. You know, are you pursuing some kind of pleasure apart from God? You know, what's going on? So, patience is a, is a production of thinking and understanding God's will for the people around you. What he wants you to do. What's his will for you in regard to these people? And he wants you to minister to them. He wants you to be a light to them, uh, uh, an evidence of his love to them. You can't do that if you're going to react to them. If you're going to strike out at them, you can't do it. So, all right. Thirdly, C here, let's talk about patience is an aspect of the of worthy, what God calls worthy Christian relating. See, 
there's a right way for Christians to relate. And we're going to get into it when we talk about love here in just a minute. Christians, Christians are to relate, and this is, should be the earmark of Christians. Jesus said the, the two things that show that would, that would convince people that he is real and that he actually came is the unity of the body of Christ and the love with which they treat each other. This love, this unconditional love we'll talk about shortly, is the key to all of this. So, thirdly, patience is an aspect of worthy. What that means is, is righteous, proper relating. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I entreat you, I, I beseech you, I beg of you, to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Now, we saw that in Ephesians 1.18, that he wants, that Paul said, I want you to visualize, using the eyes of your heart, the confidence that we have, the hope of his calling. Now, what Paul is saying, I want you to visualize, see in your mind, and say with yourself, what do you think is a worthy way of honoring this call? this call into God's grace, this call into eternal life, this call into being part of Jesus Christ. What is a, what is a worthy way? And the word, word worthy means to be equal in value. So here's your calling, which is your position and future. The calling idea is your future with Christ. Now, what is that worth? Your future with Christ? That'd be worth quite a lot. When you say... The fact that you're going to be in Christ, that you're going to be in heaven, that you're going to be indwelt by the Spirit, you're going to have a resurrection body. We're going to have a whole new challenge in the next life. We're not going to sit around and, and sip mint juleps. We're going, to, we're going to have great challenges. We're going to continue growing and developing. Who knows what we're going to end up as, you know, a million years from now? Who knows? If time even is applicable in heaven, have no idea. I just know that the calling that he's talking about here is a fantastic, incredible idea that you can barely visualize in your mind. The fact that all that's involved in being with Christ. So he says, I want you to walk. I want you to conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy or equal to your future with Christ. Wow. That's a pretty strong request. Now, he says, the calling with which you've been called, and he describes it. He's going to say, with all humility. Now, this word humility is, means humility of mind. To, to pino frosune. The word to pinos means the conquered ones. These were the ones, these were the foreign uh, uh, enemies or soldiers who were conquered in battle, who were kept alive and turned into slaves. They were, they sur they were the surrendered ones the idea. So what he's talking about uh, in, in frosune is a suffix meaning the mind. So you have a surrendered mind to God. Your mind is surrendered to God. It, it, it's not that you're, you know, meek and everything. That That's a different, that's the word gentle. But your mind is surrendered to God. So with all mental surrender to God and gentleness. Now this is, this is prowess. Prowess means to have an outward appearance of, of humility. You know, this is something I pray for Donald Trump, that there would be an outward show of humility. I personally think that would go a long way uh, to help the guy be able to sell his case. If he had a little humility and he didn't need to brag on himself so much, you know, just let others do that. You know, if there's something to brag about, but gentleness and here's our, here's our word, patience. So you walk in a manner worthy of your relationship with God forever. And here's how you do it. You express humility. It means you surrender your mind to God. You're, you, you express all of that in a gentle way, a, a humble way, with patience, being patient with people, showing forbearance. Now, the difference in patience and forbearance you know, is, are, is very, they're very similar. In other words, you just bear with people. You just bear with me. 
you know, bear with me. But they're not saying bear with me. You're saying I'm going to bear with you. I'm going to be patient with you, and I'm going to and I'm going to stick with you. Showing forbearance to one another in love. So worthy, equal in value. Live your life in a manner equal to your calling. One of those things is being patient with others. Now, this is certainly a growth aspiration. And we'll see that. All right. Fourthly, D, helping other believers grow, which is our job must be done with patience. Second Timothy chapter four, verse two, Paul's talking to Timothy and Paul's about to leave the earth. He knows he's going and he's giving Timothy these last commands, these last encouragements. He's given his last will and testament here. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, at all times, continue preaching, Timothy, don't let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody stop you. To the day, to your last breath, you keep preaching. You keep teaching. You keep telling people the story. You keep explaining to people how the plan of God works. That's his job. That's my job. That's what I'm going to do till the day I die. My father-in-law, Ron Adam, has said today, that's what he's going to do till the day he dies. Now, this is something that God puts in teachers and pastor teachers. This, this, compulsion to explain, 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 to take care of people, to help people, believers, by explaining, helping them understand how life is working according to God's plan. So it must be done with patience. So he says, preach the word, be ready. This, this means to simply be ready to talk, be ready with an idea to discuss. In season and out of season, he says, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Now, those are three tough words. Those aren't compassion words. Those are confrontation words. Those are challenge people on their lifestyle words. You know, reproving has to do with convincing them that what they're doing is wrong. That's the same word used of the Holy Spirit. He takes the gospel and convinces the unbeliever of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You know, sin because they're sinners, righteousness because they have to be righteous for God to accept them. And then judgment that talks about how if they don't become righteous by believing in Christ, they're going to the judgment like the devil. That's exactly what that is. So this is the convincing ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, this idea of reprove means to convince. Rebuke, though, that means to confront. That means to go, whoa, wait a minute. What you're saying, what you're doing, that's not going to work. You know, if you follow that path, it's going to be a dead end. You're going to fall in the ditch. You know, you're going you're gonna to fall off the bridge or whatever. And this is where you rebuke people and say, no, this is not right. This is not right. This takes great courage to do that. Most of us are concerned with how people think about us, whether they like us or they don't like us or they want to be with us or don't want to be with us. So we, we hold back for human considerations. We put our human desires and considerations ahead of our mission for the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to come to a place in your life where you begin to let that go. And even in public places, you no longer are concerned uh, if you're violating people's conventions. You know, it's, it's not normal to witness to everybody in the grocery store. So how in the world did human normality become the guideline for a believer giving the gospel? It has nothing to do. Look, we talked about this about God's authority. I hope you remember back several lessons where we're under the world's authority because that's been delegated by God. But we're actually under an authority much higher. I mean, we supersede that. You can walk anywhere in this world spiritually and give the message of God, no matter what the authority. They told Peter and James, Peter and John, stop preaching in the name of Christ. They said, should we obey you or God? 
course, the answer is God. So you go boldly. Go boldly. And you say, well, I just can't. Look, whatever you are visualizing and telling yourself that keeps you from being bold with your friends, in the marketplace, whatever, wherever you go, whatever that is that keeps you afraid or hesitant to be bold with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that needs to be found and that needs to be eliminated. That means take that off. That's old man baggage that says, oh, you better be careful. You don't want to offend them. Well, listen, being thrown into the lake of fire is going to really offend them. So maybe you're the one that's going to give them the word that helps them. You know, you don't know. But what you do know is you've been commanded to go, therefore, and make disciples in all nations. So how about we go? This sitting back and waiting on the Holy Spirit to make things happen. You know, I'll witness, I'll give them the gospel, you know, when the Spirit tells me. Now, I understand that, and that's a good strategy, except that hardly ever happens. I mean, how many times do you go out and go to the store or go anywhere and do something, and you run into 25 different people, and you never say a single word about the Lord? I mean, you'd say every day, every single day. But I'm saying, what is up with that? How is it that you think that's normal Christianity? That's not normal Christianity. But we've been subdued and seduced into this passivity to be passive, to wait on the Spirit. You know, we want to, we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to interrupt their life. You know, we certainly wouldn't want uh, their boss to see them hearing the gospel on boss time. But that person's got the choice to listen or not. My job is to give them the gospel, to reach out and touch these people. And I'm not talking about being foolish, being a nuisance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being sensitive and looking for an opportunity to walk up to somebody and say, hey, can I ask you, have you heard about Jesus Christ? Do you know what he did for you? Do you know what he wants to do for you? I've not had one negative response to that. So I just encourage you about that. So help other believers grow with patience. This is what Paul said to Timothy. Be patient with these people. You're going to teach them, and they're not going to hear it. You're going to have to teach them 20 times. On the 20th time, they may hear it this time, and then they're going to have to struggle with doing it. Be patient with the process. Everybody moves at a different rate, every different pace in the Lord. And the Lord is just patient as he can be. Because you know why? The Lord doesn't have a specific goal. I mean, he's going to win this thing. Of course, he already knows what's going to happen. But he's he's not forcing me to reach a specific level of growth and maturity. He's left that to me. That's my choice. I get to go as far and as deep and as hard as I want to go. If I want to make my life about God and God only, you know, that's a choice that people make. Now, I'm married. I have children. So my life with God is to be reflected out into my life with my family. So now that's, and that's to be done with patience. Now, fifthly, it's 20 minutes. Patience is just one aspect, one manifestation of many aspects of, of agape love. So I don't know if you have Bibles. If you do, it's, I've got it written here, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. It says, Paul has just talked about taking off the old and putting on the new. So the old man and putting on the new man. So he says, and so those of you who've been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. See that word put on? Big, big word. It's the main verb in this whole passage. Put on a, a heart of compassion. B, kindness, C, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearing or bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone else. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive others. And beyond all this and over all this, really interesting word, over all this, 
over all these things, these virtues he just listed, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity or the bond of perfect completeness. That's going to be an important phrase to help us understand how love works. Now, this chapter three, in the first four verses, talks about practice based on position. He says, since you have been united with Christ, you're raised up with him. Therefore, uh, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Pursue the things of God is what he's saying, not the things of the world. He's going to tell you, put to death, let go of, stop living for the things of the world. Let that stuff go. But he says, seek the things above. Verse 2 says, focus your mind. If you've been in the Wednesday night study, you understand what we're saying. Put your mind and focus your mind and be alert using the eyes of your heart and the ears of your heart to focus on your relationship with God. You see yourself standing before God, seeking the things of God, looking up in your heart, seeing him. You are with him. You are talking with him. He is talking with you. You hear these things. You say, Lord, I'm seeking uh, my life with you. And you have this intimate discussion with him. It's wonderful. Wonderful. That's verses one through four. Verses five through eight is to put to death or to take off the old way of thinking and the old way of living and the old way of practicing your life. And he he gets into specific things. In verses nine through 11, leading up to our passage, he says, stop pretending with one another. It's going to, your Bible is going to say, stop lying to one another. You know, I've been along, I've been alive 64 years. I don't, in the, in the church of Jesus Christ, I don't know that there are a lot of people that are sit around making up lies. I do know that people pretend with one another. They pretend to be better off than they are, more righteous than they really are, that they're, you know, not struggling when they really are, that they pretend to be Christians who've got it together when they really don't. That's pretending. And Paul says, you got to stop pretending with each other. You got to be real with each other. Then he says, having taken off the old man and put on the new man. And these are positions. The heiress middle uh, participle says the heiress tense is a point in time. So this happened in a previous time before this. So it's salvation. This old way, this old man, this sin nature controlled your life. And it's salvation. That control was broken. Now you've been given the new man who has the freedom because of the Holy Spirit to think new man thoughts to live a new man life. That's what he's talking about. Stop pretending with one another. Since you've already put that aside positionally, now we're doing it practically so that you've been given this new man positionally. Now you're building him up practically. So now verse 12 through 17, he says, therefore, let's look at these words. Therefore, now the argument has already been made in this passage that our position in the supreme person of the universe has empowered us and obligated, obligated us to take off the old way. You've been given the power to take off, to remove, I call it erase, replace, and embrace, to erase your old man beliefs. Not everybody believes this. Not, I, I don't know anybody teaching this except me. And I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. I ask the Lord every day, am I wrong about this? I read other people, really great people, who, who are great at the problem. They just don't have much in the way of solutions. I, I, I have solutions. So anyway, uh, this word therefore is the argument that who we are in Christ has empowered us to live this new man life, basically. And, and it's obligated us to take off the old and to put on the new. For those who decide to take off or erase their old beliefs and behaviors, there's a, there is the capacity to replace and embrace those old beliefs with new beliefs and behaviors in Christ. We're talking Wednesday night about that process, about how to relate to the Lord in such a way that you gain insight into that. So then he says, Therefore, as chosen of God, electos, it means the ones have been picked out. God picked you, you didn't pick God. 
God chose you. You didn't. He, you didn't choose God. He chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us in Christ. Now you say what? I, I hear a lot about this, and some people believe that God just decided who was going to be saved, and decided other people weren't going to be saved. And I don't believe that. I understand why people do believe that, but I don't believe that's the way it works. Now, how? Let me say it this way. However God got us into the body of Christ, into being saved. You know, I've got my own ideas based on the Bible as to how that happened and why. Other people have different ideas, but what we share is the same idea about who and what we are once we're in Christ. So if you're dealing with people that are Reformed, they call it Reformed theology, or they're, Calvin, they're Calvinistic, they're Calvinists, uh, I call them hyper Calvinists. Uh, and you're dealing with them in your life. Just relax. Don't try to persuade them about salvation. Just talk about, okay, now we're both saved. What now? How does it work after you're saved? That's what we're talking here. That's what Paul's talking. He's talking to believers about their life after salvation, how to live it. Now, the chosen, and you see, you're chosen in Christ. Christ is the chosen one. Every time, every time a person believes in Christ, they become part of Christ. Now, they're in Christ and they're chosen in Christ. Now, he says the chosen ones, the holy, means those who are made righteous in Christ. The moment you become part of Christ, he imputes his righteous, righteousness to you, and now you're just as righteous as Jesus. So that happened at the point of salvation. He says, it, the Bible says, we are not required nor are we able to make ourselves worthy of God. Not, not possible. So we have imputed righteousness, making us eternally worthy. He goes on and says, beloved. Now, this is real important here. This is a real emphasis. Talking about God's love. Because he uses a verb. He doesn't, you know, we're, we're chosen, we're holy. And then he says, those having been loved makes a big deal out of God loving us. He puts it into an action. He paints a picture of God loving us. He says, having been loved in the past, resulting in a complete state of being permanently and eternally loved by God. That's Romans 5.5. 5. He's poured out all his love into your heart. Loved in eternity past, before we got here, brought into a perfect state of love today and forever. You're in a perfect state of God's love. You can't get out of it. Now, who are you? Who do you think you are? God's beloved. That's who you are. The one God actively loves. Who are you no longer? You're, the re you're no longer the rejected, abandoned, alone, unwanted, hopeless person you were before salvation. Even though you may think you are or feel that way. Paul uses a verb to describe the action of God loving us for emphasis. Now, he goes on, and, and this is where he uses the word in duo, put on. It means to clothe your soul. I've given you these notes about where all this is found. This word is used in many different places, literally and figuratively. In Colossians 3, 5 through 9, our passage it's used to talk about taking off the old man and his practices. It means to reject your old beliefs and behaviors bought into out of the world and remove with Colossians 9 through 17 talks about putting on the new man. This means to adopt beliefs that, that Jesus himself used in his earthly life. Now, let's look at the virtues. Here's the things that he says to put on. He says, bowels of compassion. <laughs> well, that's just the word compassion. He said bowels because that's where you feel it. You feel it in your chest, in your stomach, when you see somebody hurting. You feel it. That's why they called it bowels of compassion. It's the feeling of mercy and concern for the suffering of others. Then kindness, Christotes, literally means to be useful or helpful. Kindness in biblical means to be helpful to someone. Not just a, a personality trait. Humility. Here again is Tapano Frosune. Realistic sense of one's helplessness and unworthiness. A surrendered mind. 
The word meekness is prouse, means to be gentle, unassuming, considerate, and respectful. Patient, macrothumia, refusal to, you refuse to retaliate in the face of provocation. He says in verse 13 and 14, forbearing one another, anako means to be firm, unmoving, tolerant, tolerant of others, forgiving one another. And this is not your normal word for forgiving. This is uh, karizomai. It's, it's, it means to grace somebody out, to be gracious to them in spite of the fact that they may owe you or they've offended you. You give them grace. The normal word for forgiveness, afyami, means to release from a debt. This is a different word. It's the same word. It's a different word than used when Christ. He says, forgiving one another, giving each other grace. Karizoma, to generously give grace. If anyone has a complaint, maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's just a general principle here. And just as the Lord forgave you, same word, Karizoma, the Lord gave you grace when you, when you deserved punishment. So, and here's our point. Over all these, the, this over all these, love, agape love, the mindset that edifies unconditionally. He says, because love is the bond of completeness. The word bond is the word for a chain. It's the word for when Paul was chained to the wall in a Roman prison. The chain that he had on him was, a, was this desmos was a bond. So love takes all the virtues and chains them together into one system. Love is the mindset that pulls all the virtues into a system for application. First, and I'm going to get through these, our position in the preeminent Christ, chapter 1, has given us access to share all of who he is and having been made powerful by his unlimited power to change our own hearts. Remember, God, when God's power is not about performing external miracles. When God's power is discussed in the New Testament, it's about changing the inner part of you. That's the power. He talks about in 9 through 11 of this passage, the position to take off the old man and put on the new. He gives commands to stop using specific behaviors and to adopt others based on who we are in Christ. So, secondly, having commanded and encouraged believers to adopt Christian virtues, he explains that all these virtues are expressions of agape love. He says, over all these, uh, put on agape love. There, it's like an umbrella. Unconditional agape love is like an umbrella over all the Christian virtues. He says it's the bond of completeness. It's a, it's a tie. It's a way of tying them all together. The chain that ties all the virtues together. Love, again, is the mindset that pulls all the virtues into a system for application. Thirdly, agape love is a fixed attitude, a position and mindset. It's a fixed way of thinking that is committed, dedicated, that says I will always spiritually benefit all everyone else and I will never harm them. Agape love is a commitment. I call it committed love. It's a dedication of yourself. It's a commitment of yourself uh, where you say, I will only do what is good for others and never do harm. You're, the good you're doing is connected to the spiritual life. You're trying to bring them to God. You're not just doing good for them. You know, you maybe you helped them pick up the trash out of their yard and you're doing it as a, as a way of connecting for ministry. Everything is about connecting for ministry. That's what love is about. Love is an expression of God. And what God's doing with everybody in the world is trying to connect with them to bring them to salvation. We're the messengers, the ambassadors of that. So, agape. Now, let's go to, you know, you remember this Luke 10, 27, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind? That's agape. It's not, it's not loving personally. Oh, I'm in love with you, God. Oh, that's a real thing, too. This is about I'm committed to you, to give you everything about me. Peter, in John 21, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And he, he says, are you committed to me? Agape. Peter, are you committed to me? Peter says, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, you know, you know, I feel I feel like you. I have feel for you. I know you are my dear friend, Lord. 
That's not what Jesus was looking for. He was looking for Peter to come back out of his depression, having done the three denials. He'd come back out of the depression and, and get committed again and go to work. Feed my sheep. I need you to go to work, Peter. Feed my sheep. So agape is committed love. Kaleo is friendship love. It has a lot of meanings. You know, somebody that you enjoy being with, somebody with whom you're compatible, or you share some type of, uh, you know, golf or knitting or reading or whatever it is you do together. You know, that's phileo. It's based on some kind of common interest. So agape is virtue. It's the loving, giving, generous virtue that gives, needing nothing. It just gives because God wants you to give it. It just pours through you. The capacity for selfless, unconditional love must be developed by spiritual growth. Here's how that happens. When you open your heart and let God meet your own needs, which is, again, I encourage you to go to Wednesday night. You know, it's a touchy-feely kind of stuff that we're talking about. It's not your normal doctrinal Bible study. It's a, it's a very personal way of approaching things. But this is where you're going to learn how to open your heart and see God and believe that God loves you and has met your needs so that you actually feel that in your heart. And that's going to get, that's going to, Provide, that's going to feel that emptiness. That's what's going to feel the emptiness. Then you're going to be, God's going to fill you up and fill you up till you start to overflow. My cup runneth over, David said. So your cup needs to runneth over with the Lord. Finally, the committed mindset of unconditional love is the unifying belief that pulls all the virtues into a system. Patience, kindness, goodness, humility, you know, it's so that all these things are, are like different aspects of love. Love is the mindset. Love is the committed mindset that says, I'm going to edify this person. If anything is said or anything is done at all with this person, it's on my part, it's going to be to edify. I'm not going to think of myself. I'm not going to get distracted from the mission. I'm not going to do any kind of harm. I'm not going to react. I'm not going to let any of that happen. I'm going to edify this person, as much as they will allow me to give them spiritual truth, spiritual love, encouragement, rebuke, correction, whatever they will allow me to do in their direction into their heart, I will do. That's love. I want to help them. I want to edify them. I want to help them grow spiritually. That's love. I would never harm them like I wouldn't harm a little baby. They're little babies in my mind. In my, uh, they're babies, you know, so you don't harm them. You help them. That's love. Now, when you have that, and that's a decision place you come to as you grow, where you finally go, okay, that's my mindset. That's my decision about the way I'm going to treat others. What happens is the Holy Spirit makes all these virtues available and gives you discernment about what's needed at the moment. Right now, it's patience. That's what we're talking about. You don't react. You don't, you're being provoked purposely or unpurposely, and you don't react. You just stay patient. And let it ride it out. See where it goes. See, see how this thing's going to end up. And you're waiting to get your licks in as far as edifying. Maybe you have to wait to the end of this for you, before you can say what you need to say. Or, Maybe they need mercy. Maybe you just need to let them cry. Maybe you need to let them cry on your shoulder, or they need to be reproved or corrected. And you go, hey, let me let me share something with you. I don't think you're thinking about this correctly. You do it all because you want to help and never harm. It's not about ego. It's not about, listen, let me tell you, I know the truth. You don't. So let me tell you, none of that stuff. The motive for unconditional love is pure. It is to help other people come to God. So when you develop that and you choose, see, there's a point where you decide, that's how I'm going to treat everyone. Boom. Everyone. It's only those that are closest to you that can break through the wall and break that down so that you start reacting again. Other people outside, you you take a a professional Christian stance, mindset, way of thinking. You're fixed. I only do good. When you do that, all of these virtues become available through the Holy Spirit. 
once you whatever you need, he will give it to you. He'll pop it right up and you you apply it. All right. We're one minute over. And the more mature you become, the more this will become available to you, the more your strength you'll have, the more freedom you'll have, the more peace, the more lack of fear, insecurities, all these things. And you'll be able to practice these things. These things will form in you. But they're not going to form in the passive soul. They must be pursued. You must pursue a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You must pursue this. Think about these things. Look at why you're not being patient. Somebody said, I really need this. Well, what what is causing you? What are you telling yourself in the moment when you need to be patient? You tell yourself something that causes you to not be patient. What are you saying to yourself? See, that's your life. Because it's not producing the will of God. It's producing the will of Al. You know, so I need to see what my lie I'm telling myself that causes me to react. And I need to remove that. Erase it, replace it, and embrace the new way. All right, Father, we love you. We praise you. Hope this is helpful. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.